Chief, Chief Justice, the candidate is ready. Thank you very much, uh, JP. Thank uh, you. Uh, good evening, uh, Judge Colapan. Uh, good evening, Chief Justice. Are you well, sir? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by apologizing to you for keeping you waiting uh, for such a long time. Um, uh, we are really sorry. You know, it, 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 it was as a result of circumstances beyond our control that you kept you uh, waiting for this long. I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you... <clears throat> You were here before, and you gathered a lot of experience regarding constitutional law and human rights in your capacity as a, a member and subsequently chairperson of the South African Human Rights Commission. Now, please, just in your own ways, I'm going to give you time to combine your experience as an attorney, your experience as a human rights activist, commissioner, chairperson, judge uh, of the high court, acting judge of the constitutional court, to, to just uh, make clear how qualified you are in your view to be appointed to the constitutional court. In other words, I'm going to leave it up to you to to brag, and uh, only thereafter will questions be put to you. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. I, I started my career in the early 80s and started practicing in 1982, I think it was, at, at a time when, well, I suppose South Africa was at war. Um, there was conflict in our society and the law was e increasingly used as a tool in the oppression of people. And so much of my early practice was really representing activists, doing public interest work, and beginning to get a sense of the power of the law, but also the powerlessness of the law in, in that context. But that exposed me to, to some important work where I truly felt and believed that the law could be used as a tool in the transformation of our society. I was fortunate enough to work in organizations like the Lawyers for Human Rights, and then in the Human Rights Commission, where one was then exposed not just to the law as it were on paper, but to the lived reality of people's lives and what they expected of the law and how the law often fell short. And understanding as well the promise of the Constitution uh, in 1994 of a better life. And that promise was encapsulated as it were in the promise that the law would, would change our society. So the expectation that the law would do much was a great one. But in all of that, I was able to get both experience from a technical point of view, but also understood the context within which the law had to be applied. So going to the Lindella Repatriation Center, for example, visiting a women's shelter, visiting a prison, going to a village in Hapasha, for example, took one outside of the comfort of the law and located one within the context of a society that needed the protection of the law, but also needed to use the law as a spear to protect and advance its rights. Um, as, a, as a judge, uh, I've had, this is my uh, 10th year uh, on the bench. Uh, I was appointed uh, in 2011, but I started acting in 2010. I've been exposed to, to a range of uh, disciplines within the law just not human rights and constitutional work, just not administrative justice. But increasingly one deals with issues like, like tax law, and recently I had to do a case on diesel rebates, uh, law relating to customs and exercise, uh, excise, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, laws relating to VAT transactions. And so the technical commercial side of the law is, is also just as important. And finally, in my time at the Constitutional Court, I was able to work in an environment with, with uh, 10 other judges, uh, working in um, an environment, as it were, where there were strong voices, strong views that had to deliberate on important issues. And that was a wonderful experience as well, being able to persuade, be persuaded, 
take a view, be willing to change the view, but importantly, to, to write a judgment that was able to articulate, as it were, the law in the context within which. So I, I think in that sense, the, the constitution is important, but how one imbibes the values of the constitution are equally important. How one understands that the stakes are high every day in a court. We deal with hard facts, we deal with evidence, but we deal with real people. We deal with people for whom our decisions have great consequence. And it doesn't matter what, what the decision is, whether it's a criminal case, whether it's someone who's facing eviction. Uh, and, and one must be always mindful of the enormity of the task. So I think having said all of that, uh, I, I think I'm well placed to, to sit on the highest court in the country. I say that with great respect, because I think through my life, through my work, I understand what our society is about. I, I was born in very humble uh, beginnings in the Marabastat from working class parents. And I've seen the lives of people, I've seen the difficulties people experience, and I still live with the very same people I lived with all my life in the same community. And I'm able to see daily their experiences, their sufferings. It gives context to my work. It frames my work within a particular paradigm which I think for me is, is absolutely important. So in response to your question, uh, I think that I am able to deal with the work in the constitutional court. I've experienced that kind of work. It's demanding, it's challenging. I'm able to work with colleagues. I'm able to understand the issues. I work hard, I work diligently. I listen, I intervene when I have to. And I think I, I write well. So, uh, and I understand where this constitution is meant to take our country to. And I think all of that put together, uh, I think, qualifies me to sit on the constitutional court. And that's why I'm here today. So thank you. I, um, <clears throat> when interviewing uh, young lawyers from, for, for positions of clerkship, I often ask them to highlight some of the decisions of the constitutional court that they believe were wrongly decided. And uh, most of them did not hesitate to um, very strongly level criticism at some of the decisions we have taken and how in their view we have failed the public. <clears throat> Which uh, decision or decisions would you say uh, is or are a reflection of the absence of depth that is necessary to do the kind of justice that uh, litigants in this era require of us as the highest court in the land. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. I think at, at two levels, the one, there have been decisions of the constitutional court where there has not been a majority and where despite the highest court sitting and adjudicating the matter, at the end of the day, um, the nation at large, the public, uh, the legal fraternity is not in a position to understand, well, not to understand, but there isn't certainty and finality on the point in question. And there have been cases, for example, where the court has been split 4-4. And I don't think that's satisfactory because that, that means the case has gone to the highest court and the expectation of an outcome is, is fair and real. And there hasn't been an outcome in the real sense of the word, but an outcome by by default so i think there's there's that uh, set of issues i think maybe, maybe while we are there are you saying the constitution must perhaps be changed to reflect that the bare minimum for a quorum should be an odd number yes i think currently it says minimum of eight and, and i think yes so the, sh the one sh should it be changed um sorry and yeah that should it be should it be changed so that it's an odd number to guarantee a majority? I, I, I think it should be changed, but I think even if a change is going to take a long time, there's nothing mm. that prevents sort of good practice from introducing a practice to say it'll be nine, so that you don't have to wait for the, for the change and you're assured that in every case there will be an outcome. No, but if you are eight and there's a case before you, other colleagues are indisposed. Must you refuse to sit? Because though you are correct, you are likely to produce a 4-4 um, outcome. 
Well, I'm just testing your sure. your reasoning there. Sure, I I I, th I think the um, the the idea that you could be courted might be legally defensible, but then I think the question must be asked: At what risk do we sit in an important case? And and clearly, having sat there before, you don't have any indication before the case starts as to where the case is going to go, how the different justices might view the issue. And so the possibility of a court deadlocked must always be a real one. And therefore, I think um, the risk of postponing the case is, is not a good one. But I think the court then must, through its rostering and through the availability of justice, ensure that at all times, nine justices will be available. I know that might uh, create difficulties because some justices might qualify to go and leave, but it may well not, be uh, that the highest court... That, sorry, Chief Justice. Just the last question on that. And if a colleague gets sick and you are eight, what do you do? Well, I, I think... On, it, your, on, your, on, your, on, your, on your planning. Okay. I think if a colleague gets sick, there are two options. If, mm -hmm. if, it's, a, if it's a short illness and, and a colleague may be able to say, look, I'm going to be indisposed for a few days, yeah. Moving the case might not be bad. If the colleague is going to be indisposed for a longer period, then having an acting justice appointed might be. But, but the, the point I make is that, that there might be logistical problems along the way. But if one accepts the principle that we should sit as nine, and, and that's your end goal, I, I think with the necessary will, one will be able to get there. Yes. Proceed. What other what other judgment is there? A judgment that you you also want to share reflections on before I ask colleagues to put uh, to afford them the opportunity to put questions to you, Chief Justice. I, I can't think of a judgment that's wrong. I mean, there might be judgments where one would and and um, disagree I'm, with. Where I'm I'm thinking about it now, but can I can I come back to that and I will if if yes. no, I think just pass. It's okay. Okay, uh, uh, colleagues. <laughs> Is that you, Commissioner Mbofu? Yes, Chief Justice. Very Can I just have the names of other commissioners before you go? Uh, Commissioner Matoro Zepu. Shlema. Nyambi. Lamula. Tepe. Suri Kweba. Is it only the yes. seven of you? Deputy yes. President, Chief Justice, thank you. And Mlambo, CJ, thank you. And Matonzela. Uh, Commissioner Mpofu, I think you may go. Yes, thank you, uh, Chief Justice. Good evening. Uh, Justice Kilman. Good evening. Um, yes, you have quite a long line of questions waiting for you. <laughs> so I'll only ask you one question. Um, and it's a, a, quite a quick one. The, it's about the issue of acting at the Constitutional Court. I know you've acted there once or twice. Uh, it, it was once for two terms. But for two terms, two, yes. yes. Um, now, the, 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 there was a candidate here that we asked uh, uh, around this question, and it's, it's quite an important one. We know that at the level of the Constitutional Court, you need, um, you know, quite a lot of experience and vast experience, and a lot has been said about the expanded mandate of that court since since the um, the, the, the leave to appeal sections have been expanded. Yes. Um, now, would, what would you say is the value of having acted in that court? Let's assume you are one of the best uh, judges, but if you have not acted in that court and experienced it yourself, uh, how, however much you might know the constitution, you know, in and out, um, what, what are the weaknesses of not having done so? Um, and maybe I want to ask the question more conversely. If we were to appoint somebody who has never acted in that court, 
in my view, that person would have to be superlatively um, special. You know, there, there has to be um, uh, you know, compelling circumstances. And I want to know if you agree with me first on that on, on, on that comment. But firstly, what value um, Ed did it give to you having to have acted there, and uh, to make you know for sure that that's the kind of court where you might be able to uh, exercise your forensic skills and add value. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Mpofu. I think for me, the, the benefit of having acted there, having come from really the high court where one really works in a substantial manner on your own, except in appeals where you'll work with another colleague or perhaps with two colleagues in a full court. So one is working with, with 11, uh, 10 other judges. And clearly, if you want to hold your own, then as I've alluded to in the earlier, you, you have to have the ability just not to be persuaded, but to persuade and to, to persuade a colleague that the viewpoint you hold is tenable. And to be able to make that persuasion, you have to articulate and you have to write in a way that makes the argument, not on an emotional basis, but on a solid basis. And I think it was that part of the experience that I found very different from having worked in the high court because it's at that level where the engagement is intellectually at the highest possible level. And so you have two choices. You can sit quietly and go with the flow, which I think would be an injustice. Or if you hold a view on a particular matter, if you've prepared on it, and if you articulated that, then you engage with your colleagues. And that's the spirit I found there, that people Say, I don't have a problem listening to you, but make your case, make your argument. And I think for me, that's the greatest value of, of having set, set there. I mean, the spirit of collegiality is good, but, but sometimes the debate is robust. Sometimes it's frank. And I think for me, that's the value and that's the benefit. Whether someone who's not acted there would, would make a go of it, um, you, you have a list of impressive candidates. It's possible some of them may do so. I can only speak from my experience. And with the benefit of hindsight, I, I think having not acted there, it would have been difficult for me to have simply started there as a, as a fully appointed judge. The acting experience was, was beneficial in more ways than one, yes. Th thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, uh, Justice Kalupa. Thank you, Advocate Mpofu. Um, Commissioner Matole Zepu. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Justice, and good evening, Judge. Good evening, Commissioner. Um, my, my, I just want to hear from you my issues on access to justice. And as you know, we all know that the system of our courts as it is now, we are not co uh, complying with our constitutional imperatives. Courts, I mean, cases take five years before they are being had. And I know one of your passions is mediation. So what I want to know, in what matters do you think we can actually fast track this access to justice by using mediation? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think firstly, I agree with your observation, and I'm sure all of us in this room would do so, that if the promise of the constitution is beyond the means of somebody because they cannot access justice, then it's really a, a meaningless promise to them. And therefore, I think that there's a, a number of interventions that are necessary. Firstly, there are too many cases in our courts that invariably get settled. They will get settled, but they run through the system and they clog the system and they use up uh, expensive judicial resources. So the idea of introducing mandatory mediation to be determined at an early stage in the proceedings is something that I think uh, there's, there's general acceptance for the notion of mediation. The South African Law Reform Commission, which I chair, has got a committee that is looking at the whole question of mediation, including the drafting of a mediation bill, and Justice Malambo uh, chairs that, that committee. So the idea would be to say, well, if, if we resort to mediation, then we save up important judicial resources and we make those judicial resources available for other matters. That's one. The second thing is the cost 
of, of, of legal services. And, and I know there's lots of lawyers here and I don't want to say it's exorbitant. I simply want to say it's beyond the reach of many people. That's, that's probably a, a better factual statement. It's beyond the reach of many people. And the Law Commission uh, has finalized the report on legal fees as a barrier to, to access to justice. The report is ready to be submitted to the Justice Minister, but we have to do what is called a size assessment, socio-economic assessment. I think that's part of the rule before we can submit the report. But some of the features that the report looks at is looking at um, curbing legal fees, certainly at the district and regional court level, where attorney-client fees and party-party fees may well be on the same level. That's quite radical, it's quite far-reaching, it's going to create um, a lot of debate in our society, but, but we have to make an intervention that moves us along in, in a significant way. The other is through more effective case management. And in the last year, we've seen how we've been able to work remotely. Uh, so the advantage of that is that it frees up more judicial time. Uh, number two, I hope it will re result in the costs of litigation being reduced because we're not using paper. People are using the electronic system. And I'm mindful that in that process, there are many people who may not be able to access the technology. But even in the last year, we've been able to ensure that litigants who act in person and who want to have their day in court are able to do so. So I've gone into court to hear matters. Litigants have gone to court where there's a special court set up for them to be able to access the judge uh, through technology. So it's, it's in the pipeline, but I think we've seen progress in that regard. I mean, in, in, in one of the cases I did recently, there were supposed to be 50 trial, 50 lever arch files as the trial bundle. There were, there was a need to make six copies of that. That would have been 300 lever arch files. The legal representatives gave me a flash disk. They said, judge, there is your trial bundle. And it worked. Uh, the rules board has promulgated what is called e-rules uh, to ensure, and I think that was published now in March for public comment. To, to ensure that there are proper rules for the issuing of processes, applications, summonses, uh, discovery, hearing. So, so I think it's a technology we must, we must embrace, but we must be careful that in doing so we don't leave people behind. And, and lastly, I think part of the report of the Commission may well speak to greater use of pro bono work, community service for law graduates. There's a whole range of factors, and I think collectively, if we allow the problem of access to justice to continue as it is, then we all are responsible because we, we represent the profession, its leadership, its soldiers. And if people can't access the law, then it's a serious indictment on all of us. Thank you. Just a follow up, uh, Chief Justice. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested about how do you think we can introduce mediation, especially in issues of service delivery and how can government come up with something as a mediation tool to do that? Okay, good. I, I think it's capable of, uh, one, is, one is able to already identify at this stage the kind of cases that are capable of being mediated. So road accident fund cases, invariably 98% of them get settled. They can be mediated because very often the dispute in those cases is not who was to blame, but what is the amount of compensation you are to be paid. Their medical reports Family disputes, invariably, family disputes don't lend themselves to adversarial processes because a family dispute must be resolved in a way that doesn't tear up the family, but that keeps it together if it can. The adversarial system doesn't lend itself to proper disputes uh, resolution. So I think part of what the Law Commission may be thinking is that in all family matters, a matter cannot go to, to court unless it goes via mediation or judge has certified that in that particular case, mediation will serve no purpose. There, there may well be cases. So I think we, we, we need to look seriously at that. There might be resource issues because if we're going to have media, ma mandatory mediation, who pays for the mediator? But I do think that even if the state pays for the mediation services, in the long run, the state will be saving more money using a mediator than letting a, a, a matter run through the courts for three or four years at great cost and it great damage to the society. Okay, thank you, CJ.
Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Prof. Slema? Thank you, CJ. I'm to your right, sir. Good evening. Um, I just have a few questions for you based on some of the things that you've said, but also generally the way in which academics are currently experiencing um, judgments being written. <clears throat> you mentioned in the first part of your interview that there's an absence of depth in some of the judgments. Um, how important is scholarly judgments in your view for purposes of dealing with this absence of depth and also linked to access to the law, um, which we are obliged to provide to the society? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think as a, as a sitting judge, I, I'm minded and I make choices all the time when I approach a judgment. I ask myself, is this judgment that requires the kind of in-depth research that makes a long-term contribution to the law, be it on a point of interpretation or, or whatever, and you determine then how much of time you spend on that judgment, bearing in mind you have to manage a busy court role in, in the Gauteng High Court. So I think depth is required. It may not be required in every judgment. Sometimes there's no novel point of law. There's nothing that turns on the judgment for the long term. But the parties are entitled to know why I decided the matter in a particular way and how I dealt with the facts and the evidence. And if I can do that in the judgment, then I've discharged my judicial duty. But that doesn't apply in every case. And I can give examples of cases where you've had to um, reflect on it. You've had to undertake research. And I think for academia, it's important. It's important as an important teaching tool to, to get young people to be able to uh, see the law in that broader con context, to be able to drill down, uh, analyze issues, um, articulate views, test views, sound, sound out those views, and to, at the end of the day, prepare and present a coherent judgment that contributes to the long-term development of the law. Yeah. Thank you. And another question concerning your position at the South African um, Law Reform Commission. The South African legal system is still uncodified. What do you see the challenges that the South African Law Reform Commission, as well as the judges, are currently exposed to based on the fact that we have an uncodified system? Well, I think the, the starting point to that question is that we, we have a living constitution. And so a, a living constitution and a codified system, I'm not suggesting are incompatible, but because you have a living constitution and a constitution that's located in the context of our society, um, the changing needs of society, the changing context of society must mean that that constitution is brought to life in different ways as the society progresses. And there might well be the need for codification in some areas to provide for certainty and predictability. But at the same time, the, the nature of a society in flux and a society that's as dynamic as ours and that is transforming all the time must mean that there will be a tension between, as it were, a living constitution and the courts. Uh, and indeed, Parliament and, and other old players uh, seeking to give meaning and content to it and the certainty of, of a codified system of laws. Yeah. If I might just have one follow-up question, CJ. The question... Go ahead, bro. Thank you very much. The question is also due to the fact that we have an uncodified system means that people do not always have the ability to access all the sources especially when you think about some of the old sources, some materials written in Afrikaans, Dutch, Latin. Do you think that there's an obligation on the Department of Justice, for instance, to assist judges in that regard? To, to assist judges in, in with regard to the codification process or to, to access those materials? No, 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 accessing the materials. Well, I, I think that that would be part of the, of the working tools of, of judges and one is one I, I could easily say yes it would be the obligation of the leadership of the judiciary to make those resources available but i also think that we we increasingly find 
that through research tools, through the internet, through academia as well, uh, there, there may well be the space to work out how one can collectively, using those different resources, uh, create a system whereby judges will have access to those historical and other relevant resources. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think they part. They would be part of a, of a judge's tools in trade, and one could argue that principally, the judge's employer should should make that available. But in practice, I mean, as, as judges, we we do research, and sometimes we rope in young students to help us as well. I do that from time to time as well. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Prof. Um, Honorable Nyambi. Evening, Judge Colopen. Good evening, Commissioner. You you have the distinct honor of having been uh, selected by the late former President Mandela to be part of the panel that selected uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. How much of an impact uh, has that had on your career? Linked to that, how do you view the work of the TRC, do you believe that it achieved what it was said to do given the current challenges facing our beloved country? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Nyambi. Um, yes, when I, when I was appointed to be part of the selection panel by President Mandela, it, it happened at a time when <coughs> the run-up to the adoption of the legislation that gave birth to the TRC was quite contentious. At that stage, uh, many of us, uh, well, I, I was certainly part of an NGO that took a strong view with regard to the granting of amnesty. Because you had your clients who had been, so it wasn't an academic exercise, you had clients who had been the victims of the most brutal and horrendous uh, acts against them. And here you had a system that would, but the, the political leadership at the time said, hold on, we would never be able to make the transition to democracy if we did not make the kind of compromises that we did. And one accepted that you were not part of the negotiation process and that may well have been a reality. But I raise that in the context of saying then the, the idea behind the TRC was for me to do two things. The one it was to advance reconciliation, the other it was to ensure the transformation of our society. And I think, and I've said this before in an interview here as well, that we may have focused substantially on the aspects of reconciliation and perhaps less on transformation. Because having people come forward and testifying and granting them amnesty is an important part of reconciliation. But I think we were all mindful that on the 28th of April, 1994, the large majority of South Africans woke up and life had not changed in any way. We had voted for a new government, our government, but life had not changed. And so the transformation of our society was equally important. And I think I've always taken the view that you can't achieve reconciliation without transformation. And transformation means the meaningful excess of people to the economy, to the wealth of this country, to the notion that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And we haven't yet. And so that's affected how I, I have worked over the years. And even today, I, I don't think that that approach is constitutionally deficient. I think our constitution recognizes the need for reconciliation and for transformation. And those are important parts, twin, twin components really, of how the society is to be transformed. And, and I think we may have done well in some areas, but not so well in other areas. Thank you, Judge Colapen. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Honorable Nyambi. Uh, Minister Lamola. Uh, CJ, uh, Councillor Adlip has uh, covered me on the questions that are related to access to, to justice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, Commissioner Tsepe. Thank you, CJ. Good evening, Judge. Judge, I just wanted um, to uh, to know if you could point us to some of your judgments where you um, apply uh, a, a Section 39.2, uh, 
which requires all all judges to uh, the courts when interpreting uh, legislation or, or or the common law or customary law to look into the purport and spirit of the Bill of Rights. If you could just uh, uh, refer us to some of those judgments you have written in that regard. Thank you, Judge. Good, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I can think of two judgments. Uh, the one I think was Samira against African Development Bank. There was an interesting judgment because what had happened is there was an emoluments attachment order that provided that uh, the employer will deduct um, the amount due to the plaintiff in respect of maintenance, which is quite common. But what happens is this bank was established in South Africa under the auspices of the African Union. And the bank then enjoyed immunity in terms of its agreement with the South African government. And so the bank refused to deduct the emoluments and paid over to uh, the, the wife of the bank member's staff who was working in the bank. And that, I had to decide that issue amongst other issues in that matter. One of the other issues was the Audi Alterum Part rule. But on that issue, I then raised the question whether, as it were, the immunity that was provided for in that agreement in the context of our legal framework that placed a high premium on the rights of children and on the ability of women to ensure that the courts were there to enforce that that immunity should not protect the bank. But it wasn't done on an emotional basis or on an instinctive basis. I found that what was at stake was not the assets of the bank. The bank's assets were still protected. What the bank was required to pay was a portion of the salary of this individual. If this individual didn't earn a salary for a particular month, for example, because he didn't come to work, there would be no obligation on the bank to pay. So there was no risk. And I interpreted the immunity agreement really to protect the operations of the bank. But if it went as far as that, it would really violate the spirit both of our constitution, but also of the uh, African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which, which the bank as an organ of the African Union was committed to upholding. And the second case would be the case of, I think it was a case I did not so long ago, which involved a disputed claim in an estate where um, it was a sad case where the ch a child had, had been born with cerebral palsy as a result of the negligence of the medical staff. The father of the child took no interest in the child. And shortly after that, there was a claim for damages brought against the state. It was settled at about 20 million rands. And after that, the child died, leaving an estate of 15 million rands. Now, the Interstate Succession Act says that if a child dies interstate, the estate is to be shared between the parents. And the father then said, well, I'm a parent. I'm entitled to half the estate. However, what had happened in the matter is that the grandmother of the child had brought an application to ask the court to assign parental rights and responsibilities to her and to make a ruling that the father did not acquire any parental rights and responsibilities in terms of the Children's Act because he had not taken any steps as contemplated in the Children's Act. And so that matter came before me and I had to then interpret the Interstate Succession Act against the principles of the Constitution. And I said it would be inconsistent, for example, to find that the claimant was a father for the purposes of the Interstate Succession Act, but he was not a father for the purpose of the Children's Act or the Constitution. That would be totally inconsistent. So I refused his claim. Um, matter, I think he may, he may be seeking leave to appeal some, I, 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 let me not say any more. But, but, but I think one is constantly challenged to ensure that you, you see your work through the prism of the Constitution. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tsepe. Uh, Honorable Klaba. Uh, thank you very much, uh, CJ. Uh, good evening, uh, Judge. Good evening. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> You, in your opening uh, remarks, uh, you said uh, law must be used as a tool 
uh, in the transformation of uh, uh, society. Uh, I just want to take uh, you up on, on, on that, just to get your views, uh, basically. <clears throat> in 2010-2011, I happened to be at the JSC uh, representing the then Premier uh, of KwaZulu Natal, 2010-2011, they about. And um, <clears throat> top on the agenda uh, of the JSC, then in actual fact, we spent the whole day uh, was the like the review of the criteria for judicial uh, selection. So the criteria for judicial uh, selection was uh, being uh, considered. You could see in the meeting that there was a strong push, very strong push um, that we must abandon what the then Chief Justice uh, Mohammed framed uh, when he was trying to give meaning to section 1741 uh, that a person must be appropriately uh, qualified and uh, fit and proper. They were actually saying that now we must, um, uh, the debate was such that, uh, the, 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 that we, we must, they were, they were, they were unpacking, sorry, they were unpacking, uh, you know, uh, to be appropriately uh, qualified. Um, and then, and the Chief Justice Mohammed then had given it a wider meaning, a broader interpretation to mean that a person must be academically uh, qualified and must have legal knowledge and experience. By academic qualification, uh, was again defined to basically mean a, a law degree, that a person must have a, a law degree. And that for experience um, was uh, that, uh, you know, uh, again, experience was given a broader, um, a wider uh, uh, meaning, which then meant that if we had emphasized experience in the same way as it was emphasized back then, we would have ended up with judges being drawn from the practicing uh, advocates. Then they were drawn mostly from sick, uh, um, you know. So, but with this change, you know, to emphasize on the values of the constitution um, and to broaden, to diversify the, ben the, 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 the bench and uh, meant that we could get people from the academia to come and be part of, uh, of the bench. So in other words, that contradicted the past, the past where judges were solidly drawn from, were drawn mostly from, uh, you know, uh, senior advocates that today we had judges drawn from uh, academia and even uh, attorneys as well. Something that happened for the first time and uh, as a result of this wider interpretation being given to section 174 uh, one. Now, <clears throat> I want to comment on this one. I meet um, 
uh, a fellow who had been here, uh, here at the JSC. Uh, sorry, Honorable Clava, are you coming closer to the question? I, you know, I you am. may not be aware. Pre preambles are generally not allowed, uh, but I was accommodating you because uh, you you haven't been in the system for, for, for some time. It, it was quite a preamble. That's why I'm interrupting you. I don't mean to be rude. Are you closer to the question now? I am, CJ. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, I, thank, I, thank I, you for I, intervention, I, CJ. Sorry. Honorable I, Malema, is that you? I was saying thank you for intervention. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, 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 thank, thank you, thank you, Sir Jay. And I meet a, 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 a candidate who had been here, and he says, from the questioning, he was not uh, appointed. He says, from the questioning, I could realize that uh, I was not appointed because I did not have uh, enough uh, acting stints. Acting stints, yeah. Now, the problem with that is that once you emphasize more on acting stints, then you are eventually excluding people from the academia because they will not have had the opportunity to have acted uh, for them to qualify inverted commas to be appointed to, to the bench. In that way, you will not have the Yuvon, uh, Judge Yuvon Mohoros, uh, Oregon, uh, Judge. Uh, or again, who were appointed straight from outside without having acted uh, to the point. What is your view on, on, on us emphasizing on acting stints each time when we uh, make appointments? Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I'll try and be as brief as I can. I, I think the, the idea of acting is important because it introduces one to the environment of the court, the discipline that is required there, the ability to work under the pressures of that particular court. If you act in the North Gauteng High Court, it's a, it's a high pressured court, there's a high volume of work. But I don't think that, that academics or attorneys are then excluded from that process. I'm aware that in our court, uh, there is an academic, there have been academics who have been appointed as permanent judges who acted before their appointment is, so the door to them acting is not closed because they are, because they are academics. Uh, the risk is that you would appoint someone without acting and, and the person has no idea of what the judicial function is about on a day-to-day -day basis. The person might not like it. It might not just suit the temperament of the person, the, the nature of the work and the pressure. So I think the acting stints are important to give the person a taste of what this job is about and the person can decide this is for me or this is not for me. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Honorable Faba. Um, uh, Deputy President Peze. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Good evening, Judge Golopin. Uh, good evening, Deputy President. Some of the questions uh, that had occurred to me, you have covered them in your introduction. There's just one aspect that I want to converse with you at, at this stage. I've had a, at a look at the review of your cases conducted by the GCB and, uh, and at the tail end of it, they set out, uh, they list judgments penned by you, 13 of them altogether, seven judgments upheld, upheld on appeal uh, and six overturned. Isn't the, and this is my question, isn't the implication of what is stated there that, you know, as, as a rule of thumb, almost in every two of your judgments that serve before appellate courts, you know, one could say, uh, you know, one would be confirmed and the other overturned. Would you consider that to be, um, you know, where you, you have effectively, you know, 50% of your judgments overturned on appeal, why is 50 um, confirmed? 
does that not reflect adversely on, on, on you? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. I, I think uh, no one really likes being overturned. And I think when one reflects on that, then there's two messages that come out of two lessons. The one, some of those may well reflect that one erred in the approach to a matter. And there's a matter, there's one or two where I can think of immediately where one made a mistake in the approach to the legal question or to the facts. There are others where, with respect, the court may have taken a different approach to the facts that I did. And in, in one or two cases, questions of substance versus form, for example, I can think of the Premier Milin case, for example, where even after you read the appeal court judgment, you accept the principle that the appeal court had found that you were wrong, but you continue to, to question whether the focus on, on form as opposed to substance was appropriate in, in that case. But I think uh, we, we function in a judicial system where uh, there's systems of checks and balances. You learn from the process. Uh, so it's it's something obviously that uh, one uh, takes with the necessary level of seriousness. Uh, yeah. On a lighter note, uh, in the light of what you have just said, uh, so the attitude would be: I accept that this is what the appellate court has decided, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm convinced that they are wrong, and I was right. <laughs> Um, on the premier matter, Judge, I, I agree with you. I happen to have been the instructing attorney on the matter. <laughs> Just declare. In fact, I think that matter was, was on the doorstep of the Constitutional Court and it got settled a day before the hearing or something like that. So that, that could have affected the percentages, uh, Deputy President. <laughs> and given that it was a big matter, it would have counted for three points maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Kolapen, and thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. That concludes my questions for Judge Kolapen. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you very much. Uh, Judge President Lambo. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, Judge Kolapen, just, I, I just want to explore the point that uh, the Deputy President raised with you, but from a different angle. Um, have any of your judgments been upheld by the Constitutional Court? Uh, thank you, Judge Olamu. Uh, yes, I think in the matter of uh, Rahube and Rahube, yes. which dealt with a declaration of invalidity in respect of the upgrading of, of tenure rights. It's a case that came from the old, um, what was then called Buffalo Tswana, yes. where I found that the upgrading act was unconstitutional because it effectively prevented women from staking a claim, as it were, to the property that would have been acquired under the old system of apartheid, and that was upheld by the Constitutional Court, the, the order of invalidity with, with some uh, small changes. And uh, in, the, in the SCA, even, even though some of the judgments did not go on appeal there, but they, would, they were referred to with approval. So for example, the Section 27 case, which dealt with uh, the provision of textbooks to learners in Limpopo, my judgment wasn't taken on appeal. But a similar case then emerged in our courts later and that went on appeal and the SCA referred with approval to, to my judgment, which wasn't before it as an appeal judgment. So yes, there, there have been that and other cases as well, yeah. Okay, Th thank you very much. I think you've anticipated my, my, my second question. Uh, on a lighter note, Chief Justice, uh, you may relate to this, that is uh, Chief Justice, that some of us came through um, the Labour Court at a time when, and the Labour Appeal Court when the appeal still lay to the SCA. And uh, when the SCA reversed us, we celebrated because we knew we were right. When they upheld us, we got worried. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner Madonzella. Yes, uh, thank you. If you can indicate me as well. Uh, sorry, who, who, sorry, who else? No, no, yes, it's Jay, just you know, if you can, I have one question. Oh, sorry, sir. Okay, is there any other commissioner who wants yes. to put a person? Uh, Julius. Huh? 
Any other? Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Madonzela. Uh, good, good evening. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good evening, Judge uh, Kolapin. Uh, when you acted in the Constitutional Court, you delivered one of your judgments you delivered was a judgment where you delivered a descending judgment. <laughs> Correct? Uh, I just want to find out from you uh, before I ask the question, I should just probably tell you what my experience in descending judgments has been. I read a judgment once some time ago when I was at page 50 of the Constitutional Court judgment. I was, I always read them. When I was at page 50 of the Constitutional Court judgment, the judge said something to the effect that since this is a descending judgment, I did not propose to set out the order that I proposed to make. And then there was another 100 pages of another judgment by another judge now, which was a majority judgment. And uh, it caused me so much strain. I never finished reading that judgment. That judgment is called Ferreira versus Levin, or Levin versus Ferreira. <clears throat> Longest judgment that I've ever read. So I just, I'm asking you about the value of, you, you went to the Constitutional Court and delivered a dissenting judgment. What do you think is the value of a dissenting judgment in the court like the Constitutional Court? I ask because we have had a discussion with the Chief Justice earlier on about how the court can be deadlocked. And it, a very unfortunate situation arises where the court is not resolving an issue of principle in that court because judges are neck on neck with dissenting judgments. Why can't the Constitutional Court agree on a jurisprudence that should govern a particular matter once and for all without mm. having to write dissenting judgments that are of uh, little interest to the parties? Because the parties want to know who wins or loses. Why should judges write dissenting judgments, long dissenting judgments usually? And uh, what, what is the benefit of all that in your view? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I, I won't deal with the length of dissenting judgments because different judges write differently. But when you, when you take the oath of office, you take an oath to discharge your duty without fear, favor, or prejudice. That means you must, with integrity, <coughs> bring to bear your mind on the facts, the evidence, and the legal question before you. Now, now clearly, there might be instances where you would disagree with the majority judge, judgment but you would disagree in a, a tangential or an insignificant way that doesn't really make much of a difference. And maybe in those instances, the question might be, well, what value does the dissenting judgment add if it's purely a disagreement on a very side tangential issue? But there would be instances like in the, in the judgment I wrote in the matter you referred to, where as a matter of principle, I, I felt strongly that the, the view taken by the majority was not a view that was one that I could reconcile myself with, not me as an individual, but me as a judge, that the facts, the law, the manner in which the institution of the Judicial Services Commission must function, and that, as you will recall, dealt with with the record in terms of Rule 53, should include the deliberations of this uh, body, and I felt it should not. Um, for, for a variety of reasons which I set out in the judgment. And, and so I think under those circumstances, to expect one to go along with the majority would, would certainly be, uh, well, it, it would negate, as it were, one's judicial duty. But I also think that sometimes dissents are written for the future. And I'm not saying that my dissent will become the reality in the future, but very often dissents are, are written for the future. Uh, and practice and history has shown that sometimes dissenting judgments in the fullness of time become the norm. I'm not saying I'm a judge I before thought, my time, but yeah. I did think you will say that uh, ultimately, because uh, it ties again with the question which uh, J. Prim Lambo asked you uh, earlier about uh, 
your sentiments sometimes that uh, <clears throat> the judgments you, wrote, you have written, which have been upset by the courts of appeal, uh, you think about them as being correct and you think that the court of appeal is wrong. Uh, well, I don't know. Just oh, that, that was Deputy President uh, yes. Petz, uh, not yes. Judge President Lambo. So, 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 Deputy President. Uh, is, is it so that you are of the view that some of the judgments that you have penned as a puny judge or judge of the High Court embrace, establish a better principle than the one that has been adopted by the courts of appeal in cases which have been taken on appeal, so much so that you feel strongly about them? And if you were to be appointed in the Constitutional Court now, you may very well affirm those principles. When with endowed with the an aura of judicial authority that comes with the court, which you have applied for. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Madansela. I, I think firstly, it, it would be improper for one to ascend to the Constitutional Court bench and then to, to fix up things that one is unhappy with, with regard to, I, I think that would be an improper use of the judicial office. Uh, and in, in the context of your question, clearly th there are times and I'm, I'm in a public interview and I'm being absolutely frank and honest, when you read the judgment of the higher court on the set of facts that were before you and you understand the legal principles that they followed and you understand the approach that they followed, right? And you followed a different approach on the same set of facts, but you believe that the approach you followed was in accordance with a commitment to looking at substance as opposed to form. And you take the view that the consequence of that is that you don't reject the higher court judgment. You can't. As, as a judge, you're bound by the discipline of stare decisis in the higher court, but you constantly wonder whether the approach you took wasn't correct. And you think, yes, it was. But one must be big enough to accept that in cases you, you must accept, and I, I do so unconditionally, that when the higher court overturns you, they do so correctly, and that you had erred and you were wrong. And, and I think one must have that humility. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nogesi. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, uh, Judge. Uh, judge, um, the Constitutional Court is the highest court in the, in the land. Judge of the Constitutional Court actually is a leader in the within the judiciary. He leads true judgment. Is it not um, a silent requirement that judges or persons who are appointed for that court, they must be in a position first to intellectually lead. They must demonstrate that. That can only be achieved by reference to cases, the decision we have, paid, we have made and articles we have penned down. In light of these judgments, for instance, in your case, half of your judgments have been overturned on appeal. What are the implications, if you agree with me, that for a judge to be in the in the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, in the uh, Constitutional Court, at least he must enjoy a measure of respect from the peers. Good, thank you. I, I think that's important. And I, and I think if one has regard to the judgments where I was overturned, in fact, I, I don't think in any of them, the, the court had sort of taken issue, criticized me unduly. It, it was a different approach taken by the court. And in some cases they were, so, so I don't think that detracts from one's intellectual ability. And I think the, the ability to be open to ongoing learning is an important one. And I think even after sitting on, on, on the court for many years, as long as one is open to the process of learning and the Constitutional Court has that kind of environment where, as, as it were, you you persuade, you are persuaded, and you you are forced to to rise to a level that the highest court requires. Yeah. So I think I can manage that. Yeah. Look, um, <clears throat> I want also in your answer to 
balance, see how to balance. How do we apply for appointment in particular for the constitutional court? Remember, the kind of judgments that comes from that court, the, the extent of, of what comes. The, how do we balance the, 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 I mean, the implementation of 174, do we say, all right, uh, we, we appoint you because you are an African, you are a black, you are a, uh, you, 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 I mean, the issue of gender and all. How, how do we take that with this? I mean, considering what I've just said, the fact that the candidate must, in, must demonstrate from uh, be in a position to intellectually lead or be accepted by the peers within the judicial. Thank How you. Would advise us. I think I think that's an important consideration, and I think the exercise that you're undertaking now is really part of that, mm. where you you are really interrogating that part of it. So I think the the ability to write and the ability to write effectively is an important one. And if I speak for myself. I think I'm able to point to, to numerous judgments that are penned, and they include, for example, the matter of Rahobi, includes the matter of Afri Forum, for example, which never went on appeal. Mm. But when the Constitutional Court and, and the SCA dealt with that, reference was made to my High Court judgment. So even though those judgments were not confirmed on appeal because they never served there, they were validated, as it were. And I can, can list uh, numerous other judgments where I think my ability to to write well, to write effectively, is, is evidenced by those judgments, yeah. including Last, including my judgments while I sat at the Constitutional Court. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, there is an, the, the, there's a perception that uh, of late there is de as, as development of judicial populism, judicial populism, where some of judgments are just a reflection of the public narratives media and all that, the public narratives at the time. Do you agree with that? Do you say, is it fair for those who make those allegations that there is a development of judicial populism? And if so, how do we manage it? How, how the judiciary should respond to that in terms of this judgment? Thank you. That's the last one. Good. Thank you. Um, I, I think that ultimately one hopes and expects, and I think it's, a, it's not an unreasonable expectation, that judges who are loyal to their oath of office will deal with the matter that is before them on the facts and on the evidence, and, and not be influenced, as it were, by external considerations. If that should happen, and I'm not saying that it may not happen, if that should happen, then the, 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 the process that we have of checks and balances and appealing against that is something that can guard against that. It might not be suitable because it, it may have happened in and there, there may not be an appeal. But increasingly, I, I, I think that judges take their judicial oath of office seriously. I think the bigger challenge is that whether we are subconsciously influenced all the time. And, and that's the, the challenge for any judge. It's to be alive to the fact that I may be open to outside influences subconsciously and to constantly ask yourself, why am I deciding a matter in a particular way? Is there some outside influence? Unless you ask yourself those questions, you might be failing. Thank you. Um, Chief Justice? Yeah, is there a follow-up question? No, 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 Chief Justice. It's not a question at all. I'm just, uh, I'm assuming that there's no next question. I was just reminding you. No, there is. There is a next question. Okay, but in any case. Uh, Honorable Malema is on the list. Okay, but in any event, I'm reminding you, Chief Justice, of the, the issue. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Honorable Malema. Thanks, uh, uh, CJ. Uh, judge, I, I thought they will ask you this question because it's going to be raised, and it was raised in the last uh, interview, the issue of age because uh, it looks like you're only going to serve half of what is expected of a judge in the <laughs> constitutional court uh, and they will be forced to come back here so i thought you you need to help us 
uh, so that <clears> when <throat> we go into our deliberations and this matter arises, we've got your view on that matter. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Malema. I'm, I'm mindful that if I am appointed, I'll probably serve approximately six years. That'll take me to mm. age 70. And so the, the proposition that arises is that will this be a value for money appointment in respect of state resources and in respect of, mm -hmm. and I think it would, because I think it would be unfair to look at the remaining six years only. I think one must look at my public record from the time of the early 90s when I served in state institutions. I started working in the Human Rights Commission from 1997. I worked there for 13 years, serving the public, uh, not pursuing a career in private practice, and now 11 years as a judge. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I chair the South African Law Reform Commission, which I do in my capacity as a judge. I, I think the CJ must remember to, to mute. <coughs> Okay, which I, which I do in my capacity as a judge and, and for which <coughs> my remuneration as a judge is part of, of my remuneration as the chair of the commission. So I think <coughs> in all fairness, one must look at the value for money proposition in a bigger sense. And um, in respect of a candidate's commitment, I think, and contribution to the country. If it's to be looked at purely as to six years and someone else will serve eight years, I think that will be firstly somewhat mechanical and, and I, I think it'd be unfair because it wouldn't take into account the candidate's contribution. Whether I serve the judiciary or whether I serve the Human Rights Commission, I serve my country. I think that's ultimately what matters. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Malema. And uh, uh, Judge Kolapen, um, which of the two vacancies did you apply for? Chief Justice, I applied for, for both uh, because I was reminded when the second vacancy was advertised that uh, your first application wasn't an automatic application for the second vacancy, so I did apply for both. And I think I was shortlisted for both as well, yes. All right. Now, um, I have heard a very disturbing remark from a colleague saying that uh, two advocates, while in his chambers, without realizing, I think they had forgotten that they were in the presence of a judge, said, you know, the Constitutional Court, uh, some know what they are doing. Some of the judges simply lack the capacity to function at a Constitutional Court level. Is that a concern you've come across, whether you agree with it or not? And to the extent that it appears to be a concern worth paying attention to, what do you think needs to be done to inject the critical capacities required at that level? Uh, thank you, Chief Justice. I, my, my experience of the court, by and large, is linked to the time that I acted there. And at the time that I acted, I certainly found I was able to interact with, with colleagues in a manner in which I certainly held them up as <coughs> judges worthy of being on that court. Not worthy because the Judicial Services Commission had recommended them and the president has appointed them. That's important. But, but as an individual, you're able to gauge, as it were, uh, the, the capacity and the, the intellectual strengths. And certainly I, I'd found that while it may not have been constant, certainly some judges have better writing skills uh, than others. That's, you, you're never going to have a situation where uh, all the judges bring the same skills to the table, as it were. Uh, so I found that the, the shortcomings that uh, you referred to that arose during this discussion were not something that I found quite evident. I think, though, in fairness, uh, what I find perhaps 
one could benefit from at the level of the constitutional <coughs> court is that one works very much alone, that the ability to persuade and to be persuaded is largely on paper. And I can understand the rationale for that, because if you're going to make out a compelling argument to convince your colleague, ultimately it must find expression in the judgment and therefore the, the paper uh, thing is important. But in the time that I was there, uh, I didn't find sort of any initiatives with regard to judges being able to, to talk about developments in the law, whether it's new developments in the area of, for example, cyber law or, or things like that. And, and I think there might be some scope in a lonely job that can be quite isolating to introduce that level of, of interaction, that level of engagement <coughs> on topical areas of the law. And, and that wouldn't preempt what they might have to decide in a case. It would, as, as high court uh, judges undergo ongoing training, for example, and if we accept the principle that learning is a lifelong process, there's no reason why constitutional court judges should also not be the subject of the, of the same process. I don't think we can accept that constitutional court judges know everything that there is to know. Yeah. Well, in some uh, constitutional jurisdictions, uh, a dissenting judgment is not permissible. Um, do you get a sense that we, as constitutional court judges, dissent? when it is strictly necessary to do so, or is your reading of our judgments that we sometimes dissent because we can? Well, I, I think the scope for dissents can be, can be limited. And I'm not sure if you can do that legally. I, I think you do that through creating a particular spirit, as I indicated in my earlier response to Commissioner Modensella. If, if I disagree with the majority judgment on a tangential issue, then is it really necessary to write a dissent if that dissent doesn't take the issue any further? Maybe not. But if it's a principled agreement on how yeah. I see an important legal principle in the context of that particular case, then, then perhaps so. But I think not permitting dissents uh, might be quite chilling. Uh, well, you, you know how we function. We, you know that we go all out to try and narrow the differences and have colleagues uh, reconcile their differences, but dissent uh, um, emerge nevertheless. What is it that you think could be done to narrow down the dissents that have an impact on how long it takes to have a judgment delivered? Well, I think perhaps through the leadership of the court, one must, must then establish the scope and the extent of the dissent and be able to engage more meaningfully uh, as, as a group with regard to whether such a dissent is necessary as opposed to having the two colleagues uh, go off and, and have a discussion. Certainly in the time that I was there, I, I didn't experience that happening really in, in the group of, of, of judges. And, and I think perhaps there might be space and there should be space to do that because it's ultimately just not the the number of dissents, but it's the question of whether a coherent message is coming from the highest court in the land. And if it's yes. not, and if it's simply by a majority of one, then it, it remains binding. But in the public sense, uh, it, it could well be asked, well, if that particular judge wasn't there and another judge was and Lee was there, could the decision have been different? Should the fate of a nation be based on, on a chance factor such as that? So, yes, I, I think perhaps uh, leadership, and maybe I'm looking at you as well, Chief Justice, can play a greater role in that regard. Well, it's a pity that you didn't experience the way we really do it. We go all out, all of us put together. Some even produce uh, different memorandums to show how narrow the differences are with a view to ensuring that we find one another. We call it two nothering. We, we, we spend a lot of energy on trying to narrow the differences. But finally, maybe, what in your experience explains the delays in delivering judgments at the Constitutional Court? And what could be done to, to arrest 
uh, that development or that trend? What are the reasons, if you know them, for the delays in delivering judgments in that court? Well, from the limited experience I've had there, once a hearing has been concluded and there's the uh, post-judgment note that goes out and there's responses, there's a clear sense of where a particular judge might stand on the issue. But in practice, the dissent only comes after the majority judgment has been written and that's quite laid down in the process and given the stringent processes that are in place with regard to the editing of judgments and the preparation of judgments that invariably uh, delays the process. So it may well be that the areas of disengagement that emerge after the post judgment process need to be engaged perhaps more robustly. And at that stage, a determination be made whether there will be a dissent if one has attempted to, to narrow the differences and to obviate some of them, or if not even obviate some of them, ask despite the differences, is there a need for dissent? So at an earlier stage in the timeline, it's clear that there will be a dissent if it's unavoidable and there will be majority judgment. And from that point in time, if the writing takes place, uh, it, it, it may happen that the finalization of the judgments might take place sooner. Because I accept that as a matter of principle, you might say, well, the dissent can only be written once the majority judgment is available. But in truth and reality, it's clear to the dissenter what the uh, architecture of the majority judgment is. So there's, there's no reason not to begin to prepare the writing of the dissent, which then can be fine tuned once the majority judgment is available. But it means keeping judges to perhaps tighter timelines, uh, which is part of judicial accountability, I imagine, because, I mean, we always well, are, are minded that we've got three months to finish a judgment and it, it weighs heavily on us. When you're reaching the three months, you, you start getting nervous. And it should be the same yes, everywhere. Well, you allow yourself to be persuaded by a colleague's well-written judgment so that your views to the contrary do not get cemented to avoid many dissents. So is that all you have to say about what could be done to expedite the delivery of judgments? Yes, I, I accept that ultimately the uh, well-written judgment um, may well then be persuasive one way or the other, but I also hold the view that those, those processes may begin to cement themselves much earlier in the process. And, and that's, that's really worth okay. exploring, yeah. Finally, uh, many people complain about the length of the Constitutional Court judgments. Um, what is your comment and what solution would you propose if you don't agree with uh, just how long our judgments tend to be? Well, I think there might be, there might be merit in some of the criticism. Um, I understand that for the highest court, you have to set out, as it were, the litigation history and, and all of those important matters. But, but sometimes as, as a judge, I take the view that if the SEA has settled a particular principle, but in settling that principle, there's been a long history of maybe eight judgments that uh, formulated that principle. Is it necessary to go into the history of how that principle was finally settled or for the purposes of my judgment, is it sufficient to use the principle as the point of departure? I might take the latter view and, and that would uh, certainly make the judgment shorter. I might have to go into the history if, as it were, the point is still open and not settled. So I think there are areas where, where one can uh, look for greater economy and efficiency uh, because ultimately, you write for the parties, but you write for the country. And so... It's, is it uh, not the scholarship fine, that Professor Sama is talking about? Sorry? Is it not being as scholarly as Professor Schlema was, uh, was suggesting? Well, I think scholarly is important, but, but uh, too much of detail may not necessarily equate to being scholarly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge Colapan. Thank you for making yourself available until this late hour. Thank you, Chief Justice. You are excused, sir.